Professor, are we in a trade war already? And, and if we are, how do we know when we've won? How do you keep score? Well, I would say uh, we're in a skirmish, uh, not a trade war. The president has said that we've been long in a trade war because he says uh, they aren't playing fair and they're uh, doing... Uh, that's totally wrong. We, we have rules of the game. We negotiate rules of the game. Uh, whether they're uh, too fair for China or too fair for the United States really depends on the lens through which you see it. But in terms of the, this current skirmish, $3 billion uh, in economies, uh, both of which are around $15, $16 trillion, uh, is uh, something that uh, doesn't have any macroeconomic significance, but does have political significance. It has a ton of political significance, and of course, what each side says matters tremendously in how the next step is taken. We know that the U.S. approach has ruffled some feathers, made investors nervous. China seems to have a more measured approach, and in fact, some of what it said has soothed investors, uh, opening up parts of its financial sector, for instance, con conceding, giving some ground here. How much do you take China's response at face value? How trustworthy is China's response? Oh, totally, I think. Uh, first of all, you have to understand, uh, I think they have a good understanding of the United States. Uh, they studied the United States. They studied Trump very carefully. Uh, there's an old uh, uh, saying uh, in China about uh, in, in any conflict, know your enemy and study him carefully. And they've been thinking exactly about that. So that is one of the reasons they've taken a uh, measured response, not escalating, but mm -hmm. very measured. At the same time, they realize that Trump uh, is what you might call a schoolyard bully. Uh, and when you have a bully, appeasement doesn't work. So what they're doing are things that they believe are in their own economic development interest. So uh, they believe opening up their financial markets at this stage is in their interest. It wasn't in their interest 15 years ago. They have a very dynamic view of development. And what is good at, uh, not good at one stage becomes good at another stage. So they've come to the view, I believe, that these openings up are uh, precisely the kind of thing that they need in the next stage. Is the U.S. doing the right thing in terms of approaching China and understanding where it's coming from and understanding the landscape? No, I don't think the United States government has uh, any deep understanding of China. And that's, that's really quite sad. Uh, I don't think they have uh, any pers anybody who's been engaged with China uh, not China bashing. I mean, they have somebody who's engaged in China bashing. You're referring to Peter Navarro. That, exactly. But somebody who is, who's really been engaged in talking to China over the 30, 40 years of its development process and, and seeing how they've uh, been evolving both economically and politically. Well, that's pretty dangerous given that everything the U.S. does with regard to global trade seems to be focused on China specifically, uh, even if it doesn't start off that way, even if it doesn't say so initially, it seems to zero in on China. I, I don't think that's completely true. I mean, NAFTA is a very big issue. And uh, what you ha have to understand from the political point of view is that Trump has tried to blame all of America's problems on outsiders, mm -hmm. on immigrants, on uh, Mexico, on China. Uh, it's just uh, a failure to take account, uh, responsibility. You know, for instance, globalization, I think we've not managed it well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has hurt American workers. But it's not globalization itself. It's the fact that we haven't managed it well. Uh, re Republicans in the United States have consistently opposed a trade adjust and adjustment assistance for those who've lost their jobs. Uh, the Democrats, and when I was in the uh, Clinton administration, we thought that that was extremely important, uh, that globalization should be trying to make everybody a winner. Sweden and the Scandinavian countries, very open, same globalization, and they're even more open than we are. People are not afraid of globalization because 
they haven't had this vicious attitude towards workers that the Republican Party uh, has exhibited. When we talk about globalization, though, I wonder if it's changed quite a bit. I mean, we've already seen the offshoring of U.S. factory jobs. So that stage of it has, you can argue, gone on and plateaued and won't come, and back. Won't come back. Right. Has it taken a new form that doesn't quite show up in traditional data on trade and capital flows? It's going to be predicated on intellectual property rights, technologically complex products and ideas. And we haven't figured out the rules of the road there. That's right. Uh, we began the discussion of intellectual property in uh, the Uruguay round, which led to the WTO uh, trips, the trade-related intellectual property provisions, uh, there was a recognition in trips for what is called flexibility, that certain conditions you would allow compulsory licenses, for instance. What we didn't have are people who really understood intellectual property. Our trade negotiators are basically lawyers who are engaged in fighting, not people who, for instance, are at the center of science and technology and have said, what is the best intellectual property structure for advancing the well-being of people all over the world and recognizing that the appropriate intellectual property regime for the United States is not going to be the same as for China. There are different stages of the development. So there needs to be a more sophisticated uh, discussion of intellectual property that we are not getting out of this administration. How do we get there? Do you enlist the help of the private sector in, in figuring that out? You need both scientists and the private sector. Uh, one of the problems in the past is that the pharmaceutical industry and the entertainment industry have really dictated America's perspectives on intellectual property. And what's good for the pharmaceutical industry and the entertainment industry is not good for the advancement of science and, and for learning in general. Uh, and, uh, and that's part of the reason why, why we're in this predicament that we are in So today. we serve specific narrow corporate interests. Very narrow corporate interests. And, and those are not uh, key to uh, the advancement of our well-being. One of the real problems in uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, uh, one part, important part, was intellectual property. And uh, I was very opposed to the way it was structured, which advantaged uh, big pharma over generics. Very interesting, when the TPP-11, when they did, got together without the United States, they changed that, because they realized there that what was, the provision that was put there was not a good provision. It was a provision that America's big farming system. All right, final thought uh, for Professor Siglitz. How does this end, or does it not, and we just hurtle into another skirmish? Uh, I think we're going from skirmish to skirmish. It ends when Trump leaves.